Yeah, so, so I do work on a lot of different things, and uh, I'm going to be around the whole day. I'm happy to discuss any of the other projects or, or really to hear about some of the cool stuff going on here. Uh, so I think maybe the really hard thing about galaxy evolution when we try to compare theory and observation comes from what, what I might sort of call the, the tip of the iceberg problem, that when we study a galaxy in terms of its assembly, we're kind of interested in the gravity and we're interested in most of the mass, but, but actually we only see a very small fraction of that mass, and then we have to use that to infer the rest of it. So that, for example, well, most of the mass is really dark matter, and of course we, we don't see the dark matter, but then even of the remainder of the baryons, most of those baryons don't end up in stars. And then finally, even of the baryons that do end up in stars, the light that we see from a galaxy is really dominated only by the very high mass tail of the distribution, whereas most of the mass instead is in the low mass stars that we can't see. And so we have this fundamental problem that we have to get from the, the very tip of the iceberg that we see to all of the mass that we can't when we try to figure out what's going on in a galaxy. So ultimately, the best thing that we can do, well, okay, we've got one iceberg, you know, we've got our own galaxy. So the best thing that we can do is, is usually just to assume that all icebergs are made of the same type of ice. So for example, we're going to assume typically that the, the dark matter to baryon ratio is the, same, is the same universally as it is in every galaxy. We might similarly guess that the stellar baryon fraction is similar to what we see in our own galaxy, or perhaps use something like abundance matching in order to try to figure out what stellar baryon fraction works best. And then finally, for the stellar population, this is where we end up making some assumption about the stellar initial mass function or, or the mass distribution of stars that, that we get on formation, combined with some assumptions about the star formation history. And there are already hints that this picture doesn't work quite as well as we might have hoped. So for example, if we start to look at the most massive, highest redshift galaxies that we see, there already is starting to be a problem when we compare their stellar masses. So on the left, I'm showing you uh, work with the Cosmos survey. So out to about a redshift of six to eight, we start to find that the points uh, lie above the halo mass function lines, that there seem to be essentially too many galaxies that are too massive too early based on their stellar masses when we go ahead and convert everything to a halo mass. On the right, this is from uh, Mike Boyle and Colchin's work with some of the new James Webb data showing that now that we try to do the same thing at a redshift of 10, now it's actually even worse now there actually is more stellar mass in these galaxies even than the available baryons. So we can't even use something like, uh, a, bar like a stellar baryon fraction as a way out. So this is already a hint that something is starting to go wrong. And, and I'll come back to this a little bit later. On the other hand, even if we take things that are better understood and, and where we think we have a better handle on what's going on, there these assumptions end up being quite important as well. So for example, one of, the, one of the big successes over the past couple of decades in galaxy evolution has been the discovery of what we've come to call the, the star forming main sequence. That essentially is telling you that there's a tight relationship kind of between the existing stellar mass here on the x-axis and, and the star formation on the y-axis. Um, and, and by the way, this, is, this, is, this would really be a, a different kind of talk, but I'm happy to discuss it later. Uh, I, I should point out that actually as much as this looks like a simple relationship, this should actually be uh, Imagine that I told you I have a galaxy and I want you to predict its star formation rate. What information do you need? And you might start to think, okay, well, what controls star formation? First, anything about gas availability or, sorry, is there a, oops, sorry about that. Pack. It's cutting in and out. I'm not sure. Oh, sorry about that. All right. Sorry. Uh, no problem. Uh, all right. That's good. Okay. Um, okay. So, so imagine that imagine that I asked you to predict what the star formation rate is in a galaxy. Well, well, first off, anything important. 
But then really, if we think about, you know, taking a gas cloud and asking, is it going to condense and form stars? Now we have this so now we have essentially this balance between thermodynamics, which is trying to expand the cloud, and gravity, which is trying to compress it. And so anything that affects temperatures or densities or cooling rates should be important. So if I ask you, should, you know, should the star formation rate, the existing star formation rate be important? Probably. Should metallicity be important? Sure, that affects cooling. Should environment and mergers be important? Definitely. Should the activity of the central AGN be important? Yes. Should morphology be important? Probably. But what this is actually telling us is it's much simpler, that, that in fact, I can predict the star formation rate essentially just from two pieces of information, for, from the, the stellar mass and then the redshift that, that tells you it's on this plot at all. So, so this is already actually pretty stunning if we think about it more. But it's a well-established observational result. There, there have been a couple dozen different studies all of which tell you that there's something like one of these star forming main sequences, a variety of redshifts, a variety of ways of selecting objects and measuring stellar masses and star formation rates. On the other hand, if we look at them more closely, actually there's a bit of a problem. So one way you could describe this is just by looking at the slope of that line. And if we, if we take these couple dozen studies, and, and this is kind of where I got interested in the problem, was realizing that if we take these couple dozen studies and just look at the slopes they reported, it actually kind of looked like a mess. So it turns out that the reason that these slopes were, were different wasn't actually because of all of these other differences in techniques, but it was because of a couple of assumptions in the calibration. And maybe the most important was this assumption about the stellar initial mass function. Because even within our own galaxy, trying to measure the initial mass function has historically been a very hard problem with you know, may, maybe 10 different uh, ideas for what it might look like just coming from trying to count stars and study our own galaxy, let alone trying to do this elsewhere where you can't count individual stars. And because we have this problem that we can't count stars outside our own galaxy, we're eventually going to assume that, that all icebergs are made of the same type of ice. The best that we've been able to do is to pick one of these. And I, I mentioned these couple dozen studies. Well, if we look at which IMF they pick, there are actually three different IMFs that are, that are in common use among different studies in extragalactic astronomy. And it changes the answer. So, so in fact, what we found is if you just pick your favorite IMF, I think we picked a Chabrier IMF for the one I'm going to show you. That, that was our favorite. But if you just pick the same IMF, suddenly these studies all agree. And I, I think the real takeaway here is, in part is that everything that we get out of these galaxies comes very strongly from the assumption that, that icebergs are made of the same type of ice. And the stellar initial mass function is going to change all of the key conclusions that we get from analyzing distant objects. So with that in mind, I think we need to come back and ask ourselves, should it really be the case that all galaxies have the same IMF? And one way we can think about this is, is again, we, we, we you know, I, I mentioned that we can think about star formation on some level as just this competition between gravity and thermodynamics. And it's a little bit more complicated than that because even once a cloud collapses, what really sets the stellar initial mass function is then a subsequent process of fragmenting into smaller pieces that, that may form individual stars in that cloud. But that fragmentation process is also going to be sensitive to thermodynamics and fluctuations. So what that means is if you change the temperature of one of these clouds, we would expect at least theoretically that this should change what the IMF looks like. And that generally as the temperature goes up sort of toward the bluer here, what we should find is it's harder to make low mass stars. And so we get a bottom light, uh, or you could think about it as top heavy if you prefer. Uh, I describe it as bottom light simply because the mechanism is more that it's hard to make low mass stars rather than that it's easier to make high mass stars. But we should get a greater fraction of stars at high mass than we do at lower temperatures. And 
so th this is this is kind of one study that I was part of trying to to figure out theoretically what this should look like. There have been a number of different studies, and these studies all get roughly the same answer, which is that as the temperature goes up, you get a bottom lighter IMF. They do get a little bit different temperature scaling, and so for the for the remainder of the talk, when I talk about a temperature, I'm going to use I'm going to use kind of this T squared fit uh, from Adam Germain's work trying to do this semi-analytically. But I think the thing to keep in mind is that generally anything where we talk about 20 Kelvin, that's going to look like a Milky Way IMF under all of these prescriptions. Anything where the temperature is higher, it's going to be a bottom lighter or top heavier IMF. Anything where the temperature is lower is going to be the opposite. Okay, so we know that there should be some sensitivity to temperature. Well, we don't really have the ability to measure gas temperatures easily, particularly because we're interested in not the, the hot gas, but we're interested in the coolest molecular clouds in star forming regions in these galaxies. And it's just very difficult to get at that observationally. There may be a dozen objects where there's enough of a full spectral line energy distribution that it's possible to measure those gas temperatures. What we could do though, is we could look at dust temperatures. And if we look at dust temperatures, here we see actually a fairly complicated story. So the, the first thing that we see is that if you pick any one of these panels at fixed redshift, we see the dust temperatures aren't constant, but rather that at different combinations of sort of, again, stellar mass on the x-axis and, and, and star formation rate on the y-axis, we see at different combinations, we get a different answer. And generally what's happening is that as we go toward the top left, so this is a higher specific star formation rate or, or star formation rate per unit mass. So as we're forming stars more efficiently, this also comes along with higher dust temperatures. And maybe one way to explain this would, would simply be that we could imagine that something about the young stellar population in star forming galaxies is the dominant contributor to temperature. So that as we increase the star formation rate, we have to go up in temperature. Okay. We also see that there's a red that, that as we go toward higher redshift, so as we go toward higher redshift, we also see that as we go toward higher redshift, that even under the same conditions, the temperatures are typically going up. So this should at least be a strong hint that probably the IMF should not be universal, but rather that the IMF should change from galaxy to galaxy, that there should be some dependence on the other properties of the galaxy or, or some kind of feedback that involves the IMF. Now, there are a lot of caveats here. Uh, first off, we don't know that the dust and gas are in equilibrium. Second, if there are different phases then the dust temperature here is some kind of luminosity averaged dust temperature, which means it's really sort of an average depending upon where it's measured, either an average T squared or T to the fourth. So that's gonna overestimate the temperature in the coolest regions. So, so maybe this alone doesn't entirely prove that the IMF is going to be different. It, it just hints at it. But on the other hand, as we start to think about the, the era of James Webb, and we start to think about the highest redshift galaxies, well, at a redshift of 10, the CMB temperature is 30 Kelvin. So at least by the time you, you get there, we don't know that 30 Kelvin is actually the temperature in star forming regions, but it's at least a floor. And so that's telling us that, that for those objects, we really cannot be assuming Milky Way like IMFs. We're going to have to do something different. And the IMF has to be bottom lighter for these first galaxies that we're seeing now. Okay. Also, How do we know that uh, what's different here is the uh, IMF is actually what's different versus the dust itself evolving over that redshift range? Uh, we don't. So I think that I think this gives you a strong hint that that we should be that we should be worried about it, 
but I don't think we can just take these dust temperatures and stick them in. So what we'd really like to do is we'd really like to see if we can find a way to, to measure the IMF more directly. And so that's what we're doing, uh, or at least that's what we're trying to do. So we're working with large photometric surveys. In this case, we're working with Cosmos, which has about 30 bands and nearly 2 million objects in, in the latest Cosmos catalog. And what we're doing is we're trying to do the same thing that's normally done in photometric template fitting. So the idea is for the photometry, we, we start by just making a large number of synthetic models. And then we just try to figure out which of these synthetic models is the best fit. So the additional thing that we're doing is we're adding one parameter that corresponds to the shape of the IMF or gas temperature or whichever way you want to think about it. Uh, I think we've now come to realize that actually it, it's a degenerate combination of temperature and metallicity is, is probably a better description. But the idea is for each one of these templates, we can just look at what happens if we change the IMF and then generate the same synthetic spectrum from the same population synthesis code and so forth. And for the blue star forming galaxy, it's a more noticeable effect to change the IMF than the red quiescent galaxy. That makes sense simply because there's more of a young stellar population. It's also the case that, that it's easier to pick this out on the blue end. But there's a significant problem, which is there are other things that can change the UV slope, most notably extinction. So what we really need to do in order to be able to measure this is to be able to tell the difference between an exponential extinction, uh, which is changing the slope, and a power law change to the slope, which is coming from a change in the IMF. And in principle, you can do this with enough bands and with high enough signal to noise, but you need a lot of information. Uh, it's also kind of a little bit worse than this. You know, in addition for each one of these, then we still apply dust. We, we, we do everything that we have to in photometric template fitting. Uh, if we're really lucky, we actually get something that looks like this, where it turns out that if you look at the chi-squared landscape, there would actually be some minimum at a specific temperature, and we would think that we're able to fit the IMF for that object. Uh, most objects don't look like this. Um, what essentially we found is that even in Cosmos, even with 30 bands, several of which are quite deep, over a wide variety of, of wavelengths so that you get good leverage for telling the difference between this exponential and power law. Uh, this is actually from, from a simulation we did just to kind of check how well we could do. We tried putting different IMFs in and seeing how well we could recover it. For typical objects in Cosmos, we really can't recover it. Uh, we can only do this for, for the, the handful, the, the few percent brightest objects in Cosmos are really the only ones where we're able to get a measurement. But the good news is Cosmos starts with 2 million objects. And so even if we're limiting ourselves just the bright tail of the distribution, we have about 100,000 galaxies for which we actually seem to be able to constrain the IMF and get a measurement. And that's enough to really do some science. So, all right, well, what are the conclusions? Uh, well, first off, maybe the most striking thing is, is that not only does it seem to work, but we don't just get arbitrary IMFs for everything, but rather there seems to be some characteristic IMF that we're getting as a function of redshift. And it, at first glance, this, this would be surprising for the same reason that the star forming main sequence is surprising, that we might expect that the IMF should be very sensitive to, to all of these same things in a galaxy that star formation rates and so forth are sensitive to. I think what this is really telling us, though, is just that the IMF, or more generally temperatures in star forming regions, are part of the same feedback mechanisms that, that drive evolving galaxies to have very similar conditions throughout most of their lifetime. And so when we think about it that way, maybe this makes a little bit more sense. Um, more generally, if we, if we look at this kind of in terms of, say, again, like a stellar mass and a star formation rate. Uh, so I, I should mention that on a plot like this, your eye is drawn to the tails of the distribution. Uh, at the top right, I'm kind of showing you what the, what the density looks like. So most of the objects are in the center of all of these panels that we get. 
But the point is we actually get very similar behavior to what we saw from the dust temperatures before. And in fact, maybe it's worth just putting these up against each other. So the bottom are just four of these panels uh, from this Magnelli et al. study that I, that I showed you earlier with dust temperatures at different redshifts. At the top, it, it's the same thing with the, the temperatures that we're getting now based on the IMF. So the temperatures that we're inferring for gas. And they really look remarkably similar, uh, at least doing exactly the same things. So as we go toward the top left, toward higher specific star formation rates, the temperatures are going up. Similarly, if we just fix the conditions, we fix the stellar mass and star formation rate and move from left to right, we see that generally we're going towards a little bit higher temperatures. So that's happening as well. There are a couple little differences. So quantitatively, there seems to be maybe an offset of a couple degrees. Uh, there are a lot of things that could be due to uh, that, that even if the gas and dust are in equilibrium, essentially all of the systematics and calibrations involved both in the dust temperature measurement where a change in calibration can systematically move things 10 Kelvin pretty easily and all of the assumptions based, you know, in this IMF based gas temperature, you know, I don't think, I, I don't think it would be a problem to, to look at this and say it's consistent with gas and dust simply being in equilibrium, which would make a lot of sense. Now, there is one difference actually between these, which is in the very top right hand corner. So, the very highest mass objects in gas temperature actually start to become cool, even at high star formation rates. Whereas in dust temperatures, that doesn't seem to be true. And so that difference kind of looks interesting. Uh, and, and I'm going to come back, I'm going to come to that in a moment. But other than that, I think the main thing that, that we're seeing here, really this should be some confirmation that despite all of the optimistic assumptions that we have to make with this technique, something physical is coming out of it. Uh, it, it does seem like a meaningful quantity is coming out of it at the end whether we're really measuring gas temperature or some degenerate combination of gas temperature and metallicity, that's maybe less clear. But something meaningful seems to be coming out of it. So there are a few problems then that, that I pose that, that actually changing the IMF is going to potentially help solve. So for example, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier that we had this problem that if you take the most massive galaxies, it seemed like they were too massive for us to be able to make under lambda CDM. But what we've now argued is both toward high mass and toward high redshift, most of these galaxies have much bottom lighter IMFs than we've been imagining. And so therefore, the mass to light ratio should be much lower than we expected. And that means that we would have been overestimating all of these masses and even more overestimating them as we go toward higher redshift. So to give you an idea of how much of a difference this makes, we just take the, this figure on the right from these Labe et al. objects at redshift 10, and, and we fit them with a different IMF. It moves from, from these black points to the red ones, where, so, where suddenly this would be, again, consistent with lambda CDM. It actually moves the masses down almost two orders of magnitude. Uh, basic, well, well, basically because you're right at the very extreme end uh, of a couple different things. So about half of that effect here just comes from changing the IMF. There is actually a second effect as well uh, that I'm including here where we're also using a younger stellar population. So the fits that lead to the black points have about a one giga year old stellar population. But these are objects where the universe is less than 300 million years old. So the, the red fit instead has a younger stellar population that's a, about 175 mega years tur turned out to be our best fit. But that also changes the mass to light ratio. Uh, and the combination of the two essentially is enough to take this from physically impossible to completely reasonable. Okay, another thing, uh, another thing we can look at then 
is, you know, is thinking in particular about uh, quiescence. And maybe, you know, does this kind of shed light on how galaxies quench? You know, in particular, we had sort of this hint that the most massive objects, as I was showing you, seem to have a little bit lower temperatures than you might have expected otherwise, and that that is a difference between these gas temperatures and dust temperatures. Well, I think it's worth mentioning that, that as, we, as we go toward very low specific star formation rates, now we're getting much more Milky Way-like temperatures. And so if we look at quiescent galaxies, we get a different picture. We just get more Milky Way-like temperatures throughout. And this actually might help to answer a different puzzle. So what I'm showing you here are I'm showing you mass functions from cosmos uh, are just for star forming galaxies and below that for quiescent galaxies at different just using a Milky Way IMF, so just standard set of techniques. Now, the interesting thing right here is this fraction of galaxies that have become quiescent. And we look at very low redshift, which are the reddest ones, uh, the way this is drawn. What we see is that the least massive objects are all star forming. The most massive objects have all quenched. And then there's some transition mass in the middle. And this is that really makes sense, at least observationally, in keeping with two themes that, that have come up over and over again recently in galaxy evolution. The first with things like the star forming or, or even the IMF temperatures I'm showing you here seems to be that galaxies at the same mass and same redshift are growing in very similar ways. So galaxies are kind of all doing the same thing. So we should expect the quiescent fraction to be an all or nothing proposition. The other series of results that we've come to call downsizing, where one way to describe them is just to say that the most massive galaxies at any given time seem to be the furthest along in their evolution. And so it would then make sense that the most massive galaxies have quenched, the, the least massive galaxies are still star forming, and it's pretty much a, a step function like thing with a narrow transition mass. Well, is that at high redshift, that's not what we see. If you look at those blue and purple lines, it actually tells us a much different story. What it tells us is that actually the first galaxies to quench aren't the most massive. They're somewhere in the middle of the mass distribution. And it's not all of them, it's just some of them that are quenching. And that's much more difficult to explain if quenching is just a natural part of the same feedback processes responsible for star formation. That instead would seem to suggest that, that the way these galaxies are, are quenching must be due to some external or environmental process or, or, or some, something that, that isn't part of the typical story. But the weird thing is that you get this different answer at high redshift and low redshift. Okay, but now we actually get a little bit different answer because for the star forming galaxies, we're going to push the masses a bunch to the left because we're typically finding that the IMF is bottom lighter than we expected, and so the masses have been systematically overestimated. On the other hand, the quiescent galaxies are at about the right mass. And so if we make this change, here's what, here's what that looks like. If we make this change, so for the blue star forming galaxies, the masses get pushed to the left a bunch. For the quiescent galaxies, it's pretty similar. And suddenly we find a quiescent fraction that again, looks step function like, but now we find that at all redshifts. So that, in fact, I, I can just draw the, the comparison directly. What we find is we just get step function like at every redshift. This turn off mass is going down toward low redshift consistent with downsizing. So we really get an answer that suggests that we should be thinking about, we, about quiescence and about kind of the, the process of quenching just as the natural result of having been star forming for too long. So the kind of mechanisms that we should be thinking about would be something like, uh, like a gas depletion mechanism, or again, there may be a half dozen mechanisms in the literature that would be consistent with this, but something where it's just part of the same feedback processes that are driving star formation in typical galaxies.
In fact, you know, if we're really optimistic, we did find those objects which are on the very high mass end. So this says they're about to be turning off. They're still blue, so they still are selected as star-forming galaxies. But the temperatures have already dropped to become like those of quiescent galaxies. So maybe these are actually galaxies that are right in the earlier stage of starting to quench. Because this has been the really difficult problem observationally in trying to, to study quenching is it's very easy to find red galaxies which have been quiescent for half a billion years. But it's very hard to find galaxies and to select ones which are just in the process of turning off. But maybe what this is telling us is that the temperature dropping is at a little bit earlier stage. And in fact, one way we could see this is if we put this on a UVJ diagram, which is commonly used to select quiescent galaxies. So the idea is quiescent galaxies are kind of in this top left corner. Star forming galaxies would be everywhere else. And in black, I'm showing you what the, what the typical distribution is. The red are where these objects at very high mass but low IMF temperature lie. And they do lie in a little bit different part of this UVJ diagram than typical star forming galaxies. There's a really nice study by Vivian Wild where she takes a bunch of spectra and uses dimensionality reduction to try to just break them up into natural groups. And the, the argument that she's making is that there are really three groups of star forming galaxies sort of one, two, and three in that order, where three are the ones that should be closest to turn off based on the evolutionary tracks that she's drawing. And her SF3 group lies almost on top of this group that we're selecting. So it's possible that this is even going to give us a mechanism to, some, to select some good targets for follow-up observations to try to study a little bit earlier stage of, of quenching and see if we can catch galaxies. It's not clear whether you would quite catch them in the act. This IMF temperature is still a somewhat backward looking thing because you're getting it from the existing stellar population. But maybe we can at least catch them a little bit closer to turn off than 500, than 500 uh, million years. And so that might be enough to, to get more insight. Okay, so I think the, the final thing I wanted to show you, um, if we really think we have a good idea of, of a way to get gas temperatures, you know, the thing that's been most useful for studying how stars work has really been an HR diagram. So the idea is we take something about the temperature. Well, I could say luminosity, but, but the way I'm gonna describe it is we compare it to some kind of efficiency for using up mass. Well, if we have gas temperatures, maybe we could try to do the same thing here. Maybe what we can do is we can try to make a diagram where we compare this temperature that we're getting against a specific star formation rate. And just look at, what, look at where galaxies lie. And like the HR diagram, well, well, first off, your eye is kind of drawn to the tails of the distribution again. So, so almost every object lies in this top left-hand corner. But we do get something that, that appears to be consistent with a track. And in fact, as we move from top right to bottom left, what we find is galaxies are growing in stellar mass. The stellar populations are getting older. There's also, in general, just kind of a redshift dependence, so that if we take slices of this in different redshift ranges, we find that at high redshift, we're mostly seeing the, this top right corner and that tail. At low redshift, we're kind of seeing the tail at bottom left. Uh, yeah. These are all cosmos. Yeah, these are, these are individual galaxies from cosmos, so this is all data. So, th th so this is the same technique where we're, sorry, is there, oh. oh, sorry, the question was how we infer the IMF temperature. Um, so this is the same technique where we're doing photometric template fitting, but we've added one more parameter. So that does mean that there is a strong selection effect here toward bright things, for example. So you're only seeing the high mass tail of any of these distributions uh, at all redshift. 
Um, but there seems to be this evolution. So this is all really taken together. This is all suggesting that what's happening is that there seems to be some evolutionary track where galaxies start in the top right-hand corner, they move left, and then they move downward. Well, of these three behaviors, two of them, I think, are ones that we understand pretty well. So let's start with the top left-hand corner, which of the galaxies are. These are just your typical star-forming galaxies. And there appears to be you know, some relation between temperature and specific star formation rate. Okay, so maybe one way that we can understand this is like what I suggested earlier. Okay, we need some kind of feedback. Well, well let's imagine that the feedback just works in two directions. So the temperature first off is going to limit the star formation rate because if we increase the temperature, it's more difficult for clouds to condense and therefore the star formation rate goes down and vice versa. On the other hand, we can then imagine that the young stellar population also is the dominant. And that's why we get some either equilibrium or, or maybe a tractor solution. But that's why we'd get some attractor solution. And there have been a dozen different mechanisms proposed for how the young stellar population could be the dominant contribution to temperature. It could be heating from massive stars. You know, it could be a supernova or when they die, it could be X-ray binaries, AGN heating. But the idea would be that in some way, the young stellar population is dominating the temperature. And if we think about it that way, we can then understand vertical tail. Down here, galaxies are becoming quiescent. What that simply says is that in a quiescent galaxy, the young stellar population is no longer the dominant contributor to temperature, but there are other things and this is certainly the, the case, for example, in the Milky Way. It's really the old stellar population more than the young stellar population that, that's contributing to the temperature. And so we break that feedback loop. And that's why instead of kind of just continuing diagonally, it goes downward. Well, then what about this horizontal tail? Well, what if we break that feedback loop in the other direction? So the young stellar population still contributes to temperature, but the temperature does not limit the star formation rate. Well, for a G's mass-like calculation, it's actually not just a temperature. It, it's both temperature and density that matter. So even at high temperature, if you have sufficiently high density, clouds will still collapse. So what if we imagine that very early in the history of a galaxy, what happens is we have very high densities in the center, further out, and the densities in the center are so high that even at higher temperatures, it's still possible to make stars. So that we could think about this top right corner as some kind of stage in which only the core of a galaxy is able to form stars efficiently. After all, we know from our own galaxy, we know that there's an older stellar population toward the center. So our own galaxy seems to have formed its core first. Maybe this, maybe this mechanism is just telling you that generically that's what happened. It, and the, the galaxies don't they start out compact, but that even if the, the baryon distribution is not particularly compact, the stellar population has to be compact because you can only form stars in the center. So actually we had just sort of written a paper and we're getting ready to submit it when it was pointed out to us that there's a bunch of Hubble data in Cosmos. And so we can actually look at some of these. Uh, so what we were able to do was to actually look at a few of these. Uh, these are all around a redshift of 0.8. So in every case here, the same angular scale corresponds to, to a similar radius. Uh, the top panel is, is, are, the, are these ones in the top right-hand corner. The middle are, are the top left. And then the bottom are these quiescent ones at bottom left. And these aren't fully selected. These are just random examples. They, they kind of all look like this. So what we find is actually really consistent with the story I just described, that in the top right-hand corner, we really do seem to be getting some kind of core formation stage where you have a very compact blue galaxy. Then in the typical star-forming galaxies, we can think about this maybe more as a disk formation kind of stage, and that that's really what the main sequence is. 
And then finally, galaxies become quiescent. And so we can think about this diagram as not just giving us uh, you know, some kind of photometric properties sequence, but it's also a morphological sequence. Even though there wasn't any morphological information uh, you know, used in selecting this. Yeah. I don't know if this works. Yeah. Um, so given how these are selected, is this consistent with being a progenitor sequence? Like could those galaxies evolve into those and evolve into those? Or are we picking out like multiple sequences at sort of different phases? That's a good question. Uh, I think as best I can tell, it should at least be consistent with this being a progenitor sequence. Um, the, pro the problem, of course, is you can never really tell because you only get one snapshot at one stage for any individual galaxy. So you're always trying to guess. But the idea that you get one track and the track looks like it's a continuous evolution of properties, I think is probably a hint that this is something that can happen. Um, we've also, uh, I'll show you in a moment, we, we've also been trying to make one of these tracks with simulations. And we're finding that with simulations, you can get a track that almost looks like this. We haven't quite been able to populate the top right-hand corner. Uh, I don't think I have a slide for that here, but I'd be happy to, to, to show you afterward. Um, you know, ours tend to sort of start in the middle of the distribution and push to the left. And I think that's because we haven't quite figured out how to get the, this burn-in phase and initial conditions right yet. Um, but we can get things that look very similar to this. So at least my interpretation is, is that this is a sequence that typical galaxies go through. Uh, but I'd be interested if you have some ideas for how we could test that. Yeah, I think we're meeting later this afternoon in any case, so. Okay, great, yeah. Sorry, yeah. And on the subject of, of testing this as a sequence, um, as you're having a higher star formation rate and you're uh, producing more stars in the cores of these galaxies, that's presumably going to impact the supernova rate fairly tremendously which has consequences for feedback. Yeah. Uh, and there is other information that you can look at from statistical properties and samples like Cosmos to see if all of this actually hangs together. If you start to see as you go to higher redshift in these more core like galaxies, a higher number of supernova right near the center, um, then that would sort of be consistent. But if they're all over the place, which is- Yeah, that, make, that makes sense. Um, I think, I think that, that's a good test. I think another test that might make sense is we're making the prediction that when we look at these core galaxies, I think we'd be making a pretty strong prediction that if you get dynamical estimates, that you'd find the baryons continue further out than just the starlight. So that these galaxies aren't as compact as they seem. So that might be another way to get at it, particularly because we have some of these at relatively low shift. So it says you can find these not just at very high redshift. We find a few of them at a redshift of, of a half or something where it should be much easier to study them. Um, another thing, actually, I, I should point out with this idea that maybe the main sequence is just a disk sequence. There's some really nice work by Louis Abramson uh, a few years ago where he tried to do a bulge disk decomposition. And the argument he was making that instead of the main sequence being redshift dependent, that if instead of against stellar mass, you compare it just the star formation rate just against the disk mass, that it might actually be redshift independent. And so his argument, again, was that you should think about the main sequence as a disk formation sequence rather than fully a star formation sequence. Um, I think finally what we've been trying to do is think about whether there's a way to test this with simulation or, or theory as well. Um, so I, I, and actually I should mention this, I don't know if there are any undergrads in the audience, but, but I run an undergrad summer research program at Dawn. There's a second one uh, run by Kate Whitaker as well that takes students through NSF. And you should definitely talk, talk to me about if you're interested in coming. Um, but I had an excellent summer student uh, this past summer, Riley Tam. The idea was that, that we, we took a 1D galaxy evolution code written by John Forbes and Mark Krumholtz called Gidget. And she was trying to figure out if she could actually get something that, that behaves like this. And turns out you actually can. Uh, and she, she was able to, to really get a nice result showing that this is a reasonable thing where you can see kind of at the beginning of this, 
Uh, I guess I'll wait for it to loop back around. You know, but this is kind of going to be this middle stage, right? And then eventually it's going to become quiescent. Uh, and then you'll see if it, let me give it one sec to loop back around. Here we go. So, so, th so this would kind of be a core formation stage first. And then you'll see it kind of goes through all three of these phases. And so this is at least something consistent with behavior that galaxies can have. Uh, and and with, with your question also, we, this galaxy follows a similar evolutionary track, except that it doesn't quite get to the, you know, all the way to the right on one of those plots. Uh, and we're still trying to figure out if that's because we're missing something in the physics or what we think is more likely is we're missing something in this burn-in phase in the initial condition. Um, Okay, so, so kind of uh, to sum up, you know, what have we learned? I think first off, the, the key point is there are good reasons to expect, both theoretically and to some extent observationally, that different galaxies do have different IMFs, and that this is something that we need to, to be concerned about and need to be taking into account when we work with pretty much anything in extragalactic astronomy. And... Second, that when we try to measure it, it does seem like we're able to measure it. And there is some typical IMF for star forming galaxies at a given redshift. It does seem like there's this, uh, there's this good agreement where we might expect that the gas and dust are in equilibrium. And in fact, this might be a way of trying to, to get at the same problem maybe this would be a way of trying to answer this question for galaxies where we don't have 30 bands and all the signal to noise that we have in cosmos. Maybe if we can take galaxies for which we have, you know, the, the right phase of dust temperature, maybe we can use that as a proxy and just assert that IMF and use it to try to get their properties as well. You know, that, that if, the, if they're kind of close and closely enough, uh, if they're linked closely enough. Um, we also find that because this changes masses, this changes a few things that we expected. So for example, it gives us this little bit different idea of quenching, where now at all red shifts, it just looks like the most massive things have turned off and the least massive things are still star forming. Quenching would just be not some external process, but the natural end result of having been star forming for a long time. And then finally, there even seems to be this hint that we're maybe getting an evolutionary sequence that individual galaxies typically follow. And this might be further kind of a way of, of getting at their evolution. And in particular, a way of maybe selecting very early stage galaxies at low redshift rather than only being able to do this on the very high redshift end. Uh, yeah, we thank you for inviting me and, and take some questions. I don't know what the order is. That's actually a question online. Um, so you said that you're thinking that the temperature is getting determined by the youngest stars, right? Something like In that. In some way, yeah. Um, so what's the physical mechanism that would cause the molecular cloud temperatures to be most determined by the youngest stars? Is that kinetic? Is it... UV is a cosmic think, rays. So or? I think the I think the one that would work best is actually cosmic rays, simply because typically if you have a massive star, what it does is it, it very efficiently heats a bubble around it, and then the rest of the galaxy ignores it. But on the other hand, when that star dies and generates cosmic rays, those cosmic rays tend to permeate the whole galaxy. At, le at least within the Milky Way, we find that they permeate the whole galaxy. They have a, a mean lifetime of tens of millions of years. And so my guess is that that's the most efficient mechanism, uh, at, least for, at least for heating the entire galaxy just from the massive stars. Uh, and there's some nice work by Pidelis Papadopoulos trying to, to do simulations of that as well. But, uh, but I think you could imagine other mechanisms and, and that would be reasonable as well. How about we go to Kedar online and then you, David? Hi. Uh, do you want to yeah. go ahead? Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, like, the gas temperature and the dust temperature will vary according to different phases of star formation and as the galaxy changes its phases. So instead of changing the IMF 
I would think that we are probably getting the star formation history wrong and IMF should be fixed depending on redshift or something else. So uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Like, are we looking at the wrong parameter to chain and rather than focusing on star formation history, uh, we are focusing on IMF. Okay, that, that's a really good point. So, so the question as I understand it is, could this be due to the star formation history instead of the IMF? And, yeah. you know, so I had mentioned, for example, that you can tell the difference between extinction and a change in the IMF because one's power law like and one is exponential like. There's a complete mathematical degeneracy between the star formation history and the IMF. You can make an entirely identical stellar population from different combinations of IMF and star formation history. So, so this is something where we're not going to be able to answer this question by mathematically arguing we can tell the difference. Here's what we found for, again, kind of from working with mock data and running it through our pipeline to try to figure out what we can, you know, what we're really measuring. Uh, what we found is what we're really measuring uh, is the high mass break in the stellar population. And then we end up putting that high mass break in the stellar population as being due to a, a break in the IMF rather than some other break. If you have a very bursty star formation history, what you would also get breaks in the stellar population for that reason. Uh, they will not, they're not going to be breaks typically in the 20 to 60 Kelvin range simply because the, the break that you're going to get is going to correspond to essentially the lifetime of a star. You know, so for example, if you get a break at two solar masses, it's going to be because the star formation history was bursty, the amount of time ago that a two solar mass uh, star lives, which I guess is billions of years. So what does seem to happen is we do find some objects where when we try this, uh, the best fit temperature is actually like 500 Kelvin. And the projects where we did end up realizing that we shouldn't be interpreting this as actually having 500 Kelvin temperatures forming regions, but rather interpreting this as, okay, there's a break at, at eight solar masses because of a formation history. So we, we did find a few examples of that, uh, but... Fortunately, at least for, for galaxies at high redshift, it seems like it's difficult to break in the star formation history with a break in, in the MF just because they end up at two different parts of the, of the mass, of the, of the mass function. Um, but I, yeah, but, but, I, but it's definitely the case that if you were to try to make a malicious star formation history, you would be able to, to break this technique. Yeah, thank you. The push. First of all, uh, welcome to Illinois. It's good to see you again. Um, yeah, it's. I think this is a really cool presentation. Like I remember seeing a lot of these plots a few months ago, and it's nice to see, like so much progress has been done in the, like over the summer and stuff. So, um, I think my question is pretty simple. But do you have any ideas about how to use, for instance, like James Webb, um, in the context of like probing the IMF here? So it's a good question, and I, I wish I had a really good answer. Um, unfortunately, it actually kind of goes in the other direction because the only way we were able to actually measure the IMF was from this overwhelming amount of information that we get in Cosmos. And even though Webb can potentially go very deeper in the bands that are available, for some of these high redshift targets in Webb, we have maybe four or five uh, non-zero detections. And so there really isn't any hope of being able to measure the IMF directly for these objects. The best we're going to be able to do, me to pick. that's one where I do think it's quite important that we get it right. Kind of as I was showing you before, the difference between assuming a Milky Way-like IMF and a more likely IMF for one of these really is enough for, you know, to either break or not break lambda CDM in some cases. But the problem is we're kind of stuck back. I mean, remember I said at the beginning, we have to make this assumption that all icebergs are made of the same type of ice. Uh, 
Well, even if you learn that icebergs are made of different types of ice, we, we don't know, the, the problem is we don't know what IMF to pick. Mm -hmm. And so we're still going to have to ultimately say, okay, here is our best guess based on the physics that we're aware of. I do think the best guess probably, well, at a minimum, the best guess had better be a temperature that corresponds to something larger than the CMB temperature when most of those stars formed. So if we're looking at a redshift 10 object where the CMB temperature is 30 at a redshift of 10, and the objects have been forming over the last 100 to 150 million years, so those stars were forming between 30 and 60 Kelvin, we probably should be using something in the 45 to 50 Kelvin range at a minimum is our best guess. And if we look at some of these redshift 15 targets, uh, it's, it's not yet clear to me if those are going to hold up after zero point corrections, but if they do, then we really need to be looking at sort of 60 Kelvin or higher at a minimum for these temperatures. But, but I think the best we're going to be able to do is going to be to assert, you know, just like, I mean, it's essentially what we're doing right now. It's just that right now the standard technique is we guess a Milky Way derived IMF. And I think we need to be guessing a more physically motivated IMF. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't see a lot of hope for doing anything other than taking our best guess. Um, I know you were talking about like looking at these uh, core forming galaxies um, and trying to find some nearby. What's like the lowest redshift one you've found? And do you have plans to like look for this phase of evolution at a lower redshift? So we found at least a decent population down to a redshift of about 0.5 or 0.6. Uh, I'm guessing that we can find some that are that are even lower. I mean, after all, if this is really an initial stage, you should be able to find very local examples. You just have to go far enough down in mass. Uh, we didn't we didn't have them in Cosmos based on all the cuts we were doing. But what what mass was that for these? I I don't remember. I. I want to say around ten to the eight, but I don't I I don't remember so. Thanks. Yeah. I think we have maybe time for one more question before we all get kicked out of the room. So, hello. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent talk. Um, I, I just I think I didn't get the how do you um, create those prescription for IMF uh, as a function of temperature? Like uh, is it's just a scaling the the Milky Way IMF somehow, or is uh, based on on the simulation. Or... So we yeah, essentially we started with the Krupa IMF and we looked at things like how the speed of sound would change based on temperature, and then tried to to work through the fragmentation process. So there's a really nice paper by Lyndon Bell from the 70s that that kind of lays out the argument for roughly how this should work, and then we we kind of ran it through that formalism. Okay, but, but there's still some uncertainty there. Uh, some parameters that are unknown or... Definitely, yeah. I mean, I mean, if you think about, for example, even trying to do this in the Milky Way, part of the reason that it's a hard observational problem more than a hard theoretical problem is because the theory side isn't good enough to, to just get it right. <laughs> so um, but I think that that's entirely true. Uh, so let's thank our speaker again. Uh, if any of you are interested in joining uh, Charles for, for dinner, he is here the rest of the day, so find some time to talk to him. And if you are interested in joining us for dinner, send me a DM on uh, the, the NCSA or the Astronomy Slack. Uh, we'll put something together.